So um, why are we talking about this? Uh, promoting amateur radio, whose job is it? This is something that has been on my mind in the course of the past couple of years. In 2011, when we won the Ham of the Year Club uh, from the Dayton Hambenchen, we were recognized for a couple of things. We were recognized because we had an ongoing educational program that provided classes for people who wanted to get licenses. We were recognized for the outreach that we were doing within the community to make people aware of amateur radio. And we were also recognized because of the youth that we had involved in the club and in ham radio. Um, I think since 2011, and I'm not blaming any, anybody for this, I think we've been resting on our laurels. Um, you'll have to forgive me being an Ohio State graduate. I'm going to bring Woody Hayes into this. Woody Hayes, famous football coach, used to say, uh, there's no such thing as staying where you are. He says, as a football team, you're either getting worse or, or you're getting better. If you're standing still, you're getting worse. So your choice is either to get better at what you're doing or fall behind. And we, I think the, the community of amateur radio is not just uh, clubs, not just ours, but others uh, are still struggling with this. I think to some extent we expect the league to do this. Uh, to take the lead. And for many years, they produced materials and encouraged us to do stuff. Uh, but I think we're a little bit behind in that. So that's why I'm talking about this. I have some ideas I want to share. But the purpose of this is to start a conversation. So I said we, I was holding the introductions to, there you go. Here you go. So let's go around the room. And I want answers to these three questions. How did you first hear of ham radio? Uh, your first contact, what mode was it? What, what, what were you doing? And who, if anyone, helped you get on the air? The, um, one of the things that I heard Ward Silver say is that, is that uh, ham radio was the original social network, technology social network. Texting. Yeah, um, absolutely. Take a look at it. Uh, I mean, even before you get to packing. Uh, yeah, just one thing. When I got started ham radio in 1963, the ham population in the U.S. was approximately 170,000 hams. Right now, it's a little over 720,000 hams, and it's actually increased faster than the population of the U.S. has increased. So it's not a dying hobby. It's just it's a different type of ham operators. Well, but you know, they I don't know how to solder. Yeah. And that, these are some of the things we could possibly do over the winter, teach some hands-on skill sets. Good possibility. All you, it's all, I'm getting to the point where sometimes I'll go on, I was on and buy antenna pre-made, and that was unheard of 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So let me tell my story. Uh, at the beginning of my second <coughs> year, I came down with polio and spent six months about in bed. And my parents put a, a radio where I could reach it. And so during the day, you could listen to the Philadelphia radio stations and some of the New York stations. But at nighttime, you know, you were getting Canadian stations and you were getting Indian Indianapolis and all the rest of that. So I, I was fascinated at the fact that, that things changed and there were, there were distances that, that were achievable. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was full of ham radio operators. Most of us were teenagers. Um, my next door neighbor, Bob, K3JJJ, uh, was the guy who first really introduced me to amateur radio. Uh, we lived in a double house. Duplex kind of thing. So uh, it was like my bedroom, our bathroom, the next bathroom, his bedroom, and you could hear the Morse code through the walls. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I went over to visit his shack, and it was like, okay, I, I got to have this, I got to do this, you know. So, um, so he was pretty much uh, sort of the guiding light, uh, but he 
you go three doors down and there was K3JJG head and you go down the hill and there was uh, K3DPQ John who's now W3MA who gave me my novice test and then there was the older gentleman who had a basement full of his shack and he was also in a double house and above that double house was a monobander for 20, a monobander for 15, and a monobander for 10. I mean the antenna was bigger <laughs> than, than both houses together. That was W3EOZ Tuck and Solvey. So a couple years ago, my Elmer and a couple of his friends came down to Prospect. That's K3JJJ, he's two years older than I am. And uh, he still lives with us already. Oddly enough, and I'll tell this side story, I'm really kind of surprised. Bobby was a fantastic CW operator, but he's not an expert. Um, I think he still may be a general, I'm not certain. But this was at the, at the time where the league was bringing in incentive licensing. And so when he had his general class license in the beginning, he had all of the frequencies. <coughs> and, and then, of course, the, with incentive licensing, they changed that <coughs> so that the, as you upgraded your license, you get additional frequencies. So we've lost some frequencies. And I think, uh, although I haven't really talked to him about it a great deal, I think he was bitter about that. I know he was bitter about that when that happened. Uh, and I think he just figured, well, what the heck? Because prior to that, if you went from general to advanced to extra, it was just sort of like a snobby thing. There was no additional privileges. No additional privileges. And by the way, it was Herbert Hoover Jr. who was president of the league, who brought that program in. And Harry W2HD at that time was on the board and was able to uh, uh, convince her not to do everything that he wanted to do. He was going to take call signs. Away from people. And that was the son of Uber, right? Yes. yes. So, uh, the, I owe uh, Jim Wilson for this story. I'm wondering if you ever, ever had this happen to you. What do those letters and numbers on your hat or on your hat mean? That's my ham radio call sign. Ham radio? I thought that was dead. You mean they still do that? He actually had that happen uh, recently. I don't know how many of you wear your call sign badges or call sign hats when you go out, I would encourage you to do that because it's a conversation start. It gives people an opportunity to, to ask you, well, what's that? Which then gives you a chance to talk a little bit about ham radio. And I think that's really, really important. Why is it important? You know, he hasn't been to a club meeting for years. <laughs> I don't think he's paid his dues recently. No. Um, I think we have a responsibility to pay, to pay it for them. Um, there's a, a little piece of ancient wisdom, uh, or I like to think of as ancient wisdom, that basically says, if you've been given a gift, it's your responsibility to then give that gift to others, to share that gift. And to the extent to which you share that gift, you will then be enriched. But if you hold that gift too close to the vest, the joy that you have in that gift will diminish. So, I don't know whether you want to consider that Zen Buddhism or whatever you want to consider it, I think it's something worth thinking about. We have awesome opportunities with the, with the frequencies and the modes and the ability to experiment that we have available to us, but we have a responsibility too to add to our numbers, to bring in new blood, Bring in people that want to want to do more investigation, more experimentation, and also to ensure how maybe a survival for the future, so that our future generations will have somebody to talk to. So I started looking. So what's the what does the ARRL say about who's responsible? Well, they they say their mission statement is to advance the art and science and enjoyment of amateur radio. It's really not very specific, you have to sort of read into that to be able to, to play with that. Uh, the mission statement says, uh, supports the awareness and growth of amateur radio worldwide, encourages radio experimentation, and through its members advances radio technology and education. Well, that's still not really addressing who is responsible for promoting amateur radio. 
I think the league should be doing more than it is. But now, our club, if you take a look at the Articles of Corporation, and I'm picking pieces out of this, obviously, we, we, we are here to educate, to provide for the dissemination of information, to organize and train, to encourage and sponsor, and to pursue other related educational and charitable purposes. That gets a lot closer to some of the notions of promoting amateur radio. So now I'm going to paraphrase Robert Kennedy here. Um, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Who is going to take the responsibility to talk to others about amateur radio? Um, the League is actually looking to its members for ideas, programs that it can then disseminate and replicate. Um, and there really isn't a magic bullet here. It has to do with your enthusiasm for the hobby, your love for the hobby, and your desire to share it with others. So, think about how many times a year people in Central Virginia hear about amateur radio. I think we can list that probably, well, you can say the public service events is at least an opportunity for some people to be exposed. So we do, what, five, six of those a year, roughly? And then we, and then we have field day. And that's it. Unless, unless there's a, a, a weather. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Well, right. Off the cable cutters. Yeah, right, but even then, you don't hear a lot about what the hams did to step in. We, we're kind of a modest group of people. We don't promote ourselves a lot. We need to be doing that. Because if you want to get my share, and that's really very important at so many different levels, you've really got to be out there talking to people about, and not, not just us as individuals, but we need to find other ways to get the word out about amateur radio. In marketing, there's a thing called the rule of sevens. It basically says that no one will consider buying your product until they've heard about it at least seven times. Hmm. And you really can't <coughs> spread those seven times out of <coughs> seven years, please. Because that because you'll get totally lost in in everything. And there are some people that really advocate seven times seven. So talking about the hobby can be a challenge. Um, and this is part of what the league has been wrestling with because the people have been talking to them about producing another video about ham radio that could be used with the general public in some ways. And the story that I heard from a fairly reliable source is that they could not come to an agreement about what amateur radio was in the sense if we were going to list all of the things that, that amateur, amateur radio people do. It's an extremely long list. I worked with a guy, uh, his name was Jerry, an extremely smart guy, and he developed this software, and he had this real ability to go into a business and see problems and see how he could build a system to address the problems and concerns, not just the ones that the business presented to him, but other ones that he could see that were lying out there. And he'd go in and he'd start talking and he'd answer the question about what the guy said, you know, when the question was asked, well, what would you like us to do or what do you, what, what's your problem? But then he would go on and talk about all these other things that could be done. And I turned around to him after going through two meetings like that and I said, Jerry, in the next meeting, I'm gonna sit next to you. And when you hear my foot, when you feel my foot on top of your foot, you shut up because I have actually seen you lose a sale because you went way beyond you know, what it was that people needed. And it's great that you have that vision, but you gotta solve that first first thing first. You know, and so and it's sort of like that with hair radio. Think about it, well what do hair radio operators do? It's a gigantic 
public service and, and building and the DIY stuff and contesting and, and you've got all the different modes between CW and FM and repeaters and, and satellites and, and you can just go on. Try to make a list. It's really, really long. So what you really need to do is you need to come up with a statement about, if somebody says, well, what's ham radio? You need to think about a concise two or three sentence statement that talks about amateur radio in a very broad point of view. And it has to be from you uh, rather than something that... Uh... So where does the club, where does all this fit into the club's current structure? I have a couple of recommendations um, that are really sort of aimed at, at the uh, publicity group or what should be the publicity group rather than the chair of the Public Relations Committee and the educational group and then to us. First of all, I'm going to suggest that there are several different audiences that we need to address. Uh, we need to address hams that are in this area that are not part of the AARC. There's a, I mean, we have, a, yeah, we have 120 members or whatever, there, but there are over 400 hams in Alabama. You know, and this club draws from Green, it draws from Savannah, it draws from Nelson, it draws from other places. So we, you know, we, we have a lot. We need to have a program where we're really staying connected with the governmental officials, the county and the city. I know that's a lot of what John does and others in the, in the areas thing, but we really need to be connecting with them in a wide variety of areas because those are also issues that are going to come up in terms of uh, um, antennas and all the rest of that. Yeah, so that's, we need to find a way to get out to young people and schools and scouting. And we need to be able to get to the general public and other service organizations. I mean, how, uh, AJ, for example, is a member of the ELPS, right? Do we have anybody in here that's part of the Optimists or the Lions or? Any other organization that uh, uh, that likes to have presentations about what's going on? I mean, there's got to be other groups that we can go out. Maybe we can go out and do presentations to the fire department so they can know more about ham radio and what we do. I mean, Earliesville has more knowledge about what ham radio does because we've been there for a field day for many years, but there are other volunteer fire departments around that really don't know us from now. So, why do people become interested in ham radio? An interest in science, a desire to do public service, or they just want to have fun. And that's sort of that's sort of the entry the entry place. So the question is: some people are going to enter because they're interested in science. Some people are going to enter because they want to do public service. And some people are going to enter because they see people out in front of them and they want to be part of that. And our challenge as a club is to bring them in where they're interested and then to work to expand their vision of what they can do. So promotional people have got to figure out who the audience is, what's the best media for them to, to reach these people, and what messages would be most effective. And the other thing that you've got to keep in mind, and I was trying to get at this with the introduction, this is sort of a, a quickly put together picture of how amateur radio has somewhat changed over the years since about 1950. And I'm sure there are, it's not totally accurate, but so my point to get to this is that if you ask somebody to describe the golden age of amateur radio, a licensed ham, what they're probably going to describe as the golden age is the first five years after they got their licenses, what they were doing at that point in time. So a, a really startling way to look at this is that people who are in the first two groups normally think about stations like a, like a room that has a big desk with an equipment, et cetera. But people that are in this last group they're probably sitting there with their Raspberry Pi and connecting to something else where they may have something else that they can use to remote into a transmitter that they have in the corner of a room. 
So they're not looking at the big station like those of us in these other two rooms have been looking at. But amateur radio is kind of an additive thing. It's not like when the new things come along, the other things go away. So in the 50s and the 70s, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about uh, homebrew, surplus, kit building, uh, and some commercial stuff. And then in the 70s to the 90s, you know, when you get into packet radio, credit circuits, um, the, uh, a lot of VHF and FM. When I was uh, uh, in the hobby initially, yes, there was two meters, but there were no repeaters. It was two meter AM and six meter AM. So, and now you've got the Raspberry Pi and the Arduinos and all these digital modes that are out there that uh, pull signals out of uh, uh, the air at 30 dB below the, the noise level. So, it, 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 the, the hobby is changing. So, you got to understand in two groups you've got, the, you've got the changers and the changees, and how you interact with people from the other groups is really important. The most dangerous words you can say to somebody who's doing something in amateur radio is, that's not real amateur radio. What you really want to do is you want to be supportive of these people as they are experimenting with the new technology. So it's important to be reinforced. Remember, you were once a young whippersnapper. I'm going to inject one thing. There's a lot of hams for multiple reasons start out on two years and they never get that exposure to HF. And that's something that we as a club really need to work Invite them to your shack. Yeah. Invite them to the shack. Make sure we bring them into field day so they get a chance to operate on the field day. I mean, from, from my point of view, if for somebody to sit down <coughs> field day and work for about an hour, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a powerful, it's, it's, it's got to be like cocaine. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you see, wow, this is desirable, I want to do this, but I'm just doing this thing over here, so it's, it's addictive, so to speak. I'm not advocating the use of cocaine, I'm just simply saying it's a powerful way to expose these people to something that they haven't done that. We can't wait for field day here. Year round opportunity. Well, that's true. Uh, there are some clubs that do many field days. Yep. And there is also a thing called Winter Field Day <coughs> that some clubs have been involved in. And of course, the special event station thing that we're doing is another opportunity to, to get people on the air. We can do other special event stations. So I hope that you don't lose the sign that's up here on the slide. Yeah. Yesterday's technology, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so a member of that? No, no, okay. just I, I came across that at Dayton a few years ago, and I thought it was a fantastic, uh, a fantastic picture. So, I think we need to work to increase the club and the hobby's visibility. We need to expand the public relations committee to, to make its charge the promotion of amateur radio throughout the year, not just the promotion of field day. And it, and we can't put all of that responsibility on the shoulders of the person who chairs it. We really need to have other people involved in building a year-round marketing program. Start a speakers group, develop presentations, uh, and go out and, and make them. Make a commitment to have at least two licensing courses a year. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Stu this morning, Manassas does four a year. Uh, and they've got one guy that does it. And, and so that's, that's the downfall. If you put all of it into one person, you know, and that one person gets tired or that one person moves away, you hear that giant sucking sound. You know, so we really need, and, and by the way, I was really impressed the last time Rick pulled together the technician, technician's class because we had a lot of instructors that came out and taught. So he has the support of other people. He doesn't have to do every single lesson himself. As a matter of fact, I think it's somebody who's kind of feeling like, when can I get in and teach a section here? Because we had a lot of people doing that. So I, I, it's important to help show up at our board of directors. And I hope so too. Um, I also have a notion, and this comes to me from, from my years working at church. Take it upon yourself 
to within the next two years to recruit one person and help them to become a hand. Now you're probably going to have to show a lot of people, you know, a hobby to get that one. But I'm saying, 24 months. You know, this, each one of us bring one person into the hobby. If every single ham did that, you know, we would have one and a half million ham radio operators on, and, um, in the United States. So, and embrace the challenge. So, here's a brief little ditty that uh, I really like. I'm disappointed in the league. This is something that the Radio Society of uh, Great Britain put together. It's a fairly short video, five minutes worth. It's superior to the AWR one. <laughs> <laughs>